Tell Did me you? when you're ready. I'm ready. Oh, okay, great. So I'll call the meeting to order at 6.36 p.m. of the Culture, Climate, and Behavior Committee. And call, ask for the roll. All right, Dr. Lamar Adams, Ammons. I am here. Uh, Aliyah Anthony. Trinity Anderson. Talib Beckman Goss. Here. Janelle Bishop. She's here. She's, I saw her. She's oh. here, but she can't. She's connecting to audio right now, Gil. Okay. Wendy Daniels. Here. Yeah, uh, Linda Francis. Here. Karen Grimes. Here. Laura Hardwick. She might not be. Gina Harris. Here. Megumi Hoshi. No. Greg Johnson. Yes. Yes. Uh, Lindsay Kirby. No. Cheryl Jones McLeod. Oh, sorry. Present. Okay, Dr. Carrie Cam. Here. Kibred Henry. Henry Kibred. Kabrib. No. Kabrib Henry. Thank He's not here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Francis Kraft. Here. Jason Lee. Here. Rolf Matari. Present. Melanie, Melanie McQueen. Dr. Jackie Moore. Livia Nitschke. Kathleen Ostra. Kayla Perez. Kayla. She always corrected me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm here. You're here? Mm hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Pruitt Adams. Here. Dr. Sanders. Here. No! Oh, oh my God. Oh, Talib, you didn't know that? No, what? Uh, who just said, oh my God? Talib said that. I didn't say that. I thought no. it was you. I was just smiling. Like it. Oh. it looked like it was you. Felicia Starks Turner. Here. Susan Steffens. Here. Chase Thompson. Here. David Wexler. Here. Dr. Mary Young. Thank you. And Melanie McQueen just got here also. Oh, um, excellent. Yeah. Thank you. All right. And Thank Jason you. Lee is here. Did you call his name? I thought I did. Yes, I did. And he responded. Yes. Thank you. You called Dave Waxler? Yes, I did. Yes. Okay, sorry, I missed that one. Okay, Thank before we get into the visitor comments, um, I just want to just a real quick housekeeping for a Zoom meeting. If everybody can mute themselves until you're speaking and then unmute yourselves then because we'll, a lot of people will get a lot of feedback and a, a reverb. If you um, do not want to show your face this evening, that's perfectly all right. So feel free to um, not have your camera on, but just when you're, res when you're responding, if you could make sure that we know that it's you, that would be great. Those are the only two pieces as far as us doing this virtually that I wanted to make sure I got out there just so that we're, um, everybody has a lot of stuff going on in their home. So I'm mindful of like distraction noise, except for me, it's just me by myself. Okay. Um, so uh, Gail, visitor comments? Yes, we have one um, from Dr. John Duffy. And so I, I will read it now. It says, dear committee members, thank you for your service to this committee. 
Your work is more important than ever in these troubling, sad, and disruptive times. If you have not heard the discussion of the board decision to proceed with the 36.2 million phase one imagine plan, I encourage you to do so. I found it difficult along with many other advocates for equity in the community to accept the board's unanimous decision and I have worked hard to more fully understand their thinking. Most concerning was that this decision was against the recommendation by our administration to postpone any new construction. As far as I know, and we are still looking to fully understand the administration's rationale, is that their recommendation was not simply tied to our state and district's wildly uncertain financial future. We can only hope that the recommendation was, all, was also an expression of the likely need for new resources to fulfill any goals around equ racial equity work tied to school culture, culture and trans transformative teaching and learning that can expand opportunity for all of our students. Fulfill the plans for freshman curricular restructuring, course restructuring, as well as create programs and supports for student academic and emotional well-being when so much now during the COVID-19 pandemic is working against those ends. Tonight, CEEE -E -E and other equity advocates in our community call on this committee to pause and do so as other schools around the nation are doing, to reimagine what the learning health and safety of the students will look like and require for the foreseeable future. I ask you, what issue facing our children's threatens their academic, social, and emotional well-being more than the present crisis. Without a doubt, this, this pandemic is unprecedented assault on culture, equity, and socioeconomic goals of this committee and the 2017-22 strategic plan. We urge you to take up these challenges without delay. This committee broadly represents our racial and culturally diverse community, you are uniquely positioned to guide the full board and assure that the community that we will advocate, allocate program resources, personnel, and support staff in innovative ways to protect and support all of our students, but especially those who have been inequitably hurt in these trying times. The work is central to this racial equity policy adopted by District 200 just over one year ago. Let us fully live up to the goals and ideals expressed in the policy position, position, vision. In a separate communication, we have provided some resource links to inform your understanding of what others around the nation are thinking about education in this area. And that's from John Duffy and he's with the Community, uh, community of Equity and Excellence in Education. That's it. That's all I have. Thanks, Gail. Um, I, there was a message in the chat box that there is another comment from the Apple group. And um, can they read it or should she send it to you? How do we have to do that? You should send it to me. OK. Oh, and we can read it in a moment. OK. Um, can you send it, please, um, Melanie, to her? By email, just email it. Yes, please. Gil, if you could also, could you make sure the statement that the board um, made about the decision that was made, can you make sure that that gets sent to the entire committee as well? I'd be happy to do so. Thank you. So we'll just wait a minute because I'd like us to read, um, I'd like for us to have the rest of the public comments before we move forward. Not received yet, I'm sorry. 
Okay. It looks like she's just, she just sent it just now. Oh, so Apple has asked, are we providing virtual tutors and what is the attendance since e-learning has happened? Thank you, Gail. That's You're information welcome. if you want that we don't have on hand with us today regarding the attendance and, and tutors. Uh, we were not prepared to answer that today, but we can send them that information. Can I uh, jump in for a second there too? But one way to go for um, some of that information would be to take a look at the board report that we presented uh, in, at the April regular board meeting. Um, it has scary. attendance data and a lot of student support information that we've been working on since uh, mid-March. So. Can we send that to them as well? Can that be sent or no? It, I don't can, know it can be sent, but if they want to access it immediately, it's on the website. If they go to where you go to the board meeting, they could click on that item. Uh, it's the, present, the PowerPoint should also be in there, but Gail can send it. Thank you. Gail, are there any other visitor comments? You're muted, Gail. I don't know if you're responding. Yes, I'm sorry. I muted myself before. There is, There are no other comments that I know about. OK, thank you. Um, I would ask for approval of the minutes of March 3rd, 2020. So moved. Second. Gail, did you get who everyone was for that? I muted myself too early. Um, I didn't get the second. I heard Joy Lynn. The second was Cheryl Lynn. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, I'm good. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, Chris, can you put the um, restorative practices piece up? So the very first part of our meeting um, in keeping with our practice is going to be um, a restorative circle and how we'll do it is um, I will call on you based on the order that I have you on my screen. Um, and our question is about um, First, first, I just want to preface um, this meeting because we're in the middle of something that has not um, none of us have experienced before. And thank you all for showing up tonight. And our conversation tonight was scheduled to be geared around the code of conduct, which is a big piece of work for our committee to do because as the high school is transitioning to a more restorative platform and a more restorative format of, of being, a way of being, the board of directors is waiting, the, the board, our ward is waiting for, the school board is waiting for um, input from us in order to move forward. So as we're moving into our restorative pro process tonight, the question that I want to ask is um, in a virtual world that we're living in now, like this, this, this way of being that we're in, are you, how do you experience restorative practices now and how are you? Right, so how, how would you experience restorative practices now in this virtual format and how <clears throat> how are you okay so i'm going to start um i'm going to actually go starting at my top left which is greg i don't know why but i had this feeling gina that uh, i was <laughs> first i just had that, that feeling coming um so I'm, I'm trying to think about how to respond to the first question. So while I'm brewing thoughts for that, let me respond to the second one. Um, I'm doing fine. I think our, our family is doing fine with uh, 
with the uh, the changes that we've had over the past seven seven and eight weeks, uh, this is trying. And I think with the biggest surprise I, I can add to that is that um, uh, being at home, as comfortable and pleasant as that is, um, and as as fortunate as I am to be in, in this home with my family, it's hard. It's hard not stop to be at home, and it is stressful and it is trying in ways that you wouldn't anticipate. Um, but this is so unsettling uh, that it's just, it's, it is, um, it's going well, but it is a little hard, you know, to uh, go through the same routines like this every day. As far as experiencing restorative, um, restorative practices, um, I guess, I, you know, honestly, in part, I guess I'm not totally understanding the question. Um, so, um, like, how are we approaching the work as a school? I could talk about that and my role in that, but I'm not quite sure if that's hitting at your question. So I, since I'm first, I'm gonna ask for a little clarity, Jean. Yeah, actually, however you wanna answer it, right? Like, so in this, in this digital world that we're living in, how are you experiencing, how could you, and how are you experiencing restorative practices? Yeah, I think it's, I'll just say, I think it's very easy in this world right now to move into kind of transactional conversations and ignore the importance of the real human connection that we thrive on usually when we're working in education uh, and we have face-to-face -face interactions all the time. But um, it is hard to really understand and check and read people's nonverbals and understand uh, really how we are presenting ourselves in our meetings all the time. Um, and not being able to do that um, is, 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 definitely, is definitely a challenge. So I think uh, to the extent that those things help to aid our restorative approach to what we do, um, it, has, it has been a challenge. And I, I, think, uh, I think I speak for a lot of people that I've been working with over the past several weeks that we feel the stressors there. So thank you for that. Thanks, Greg. Uh, Kyla, you're next. And Chris, could you scroll so that the slide is on what our agreements are, please? Um, so for me, I feel like with restorative justice, um, as a student, I felt it in the ways of um, teachers being really understanding. Um, for the beginning week of e-learning, it was tricky because my mom was working from home, and so we were both really using up um, our internet. And just for me to be able to um, email my teachers and be like, I'm having a hard time, these assignments are taking a long time to submit, um, and I'm, I'm struggling, and I recognize that the internet is definitely a privilege um, that I'm sure a lot of students who maybe relied on the library or relied on a public place for free access to Wi-Fi are having a hard time right now. And so to know that our teachers are um, being really understanding is, is wonderful. Um, and just thinking about um, how we can take that understanding uh, further and, and out of quarantine, because I feel like people have been um, just really supportive and it's been, it's been nice to come together in that way. And I wanna see that continue in the work outside of right now. Um, and just generally, I've been good. My family's been good. Um, my birthday is this weekend. <laughs> So it'll be interesting quarantine birthday. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Kyla. Next is Chase. I would say that in terms of restorative practices, I think that since we're all in the same situation, we are doing a lot better of a job relating to each other and communicating about how we're feeling since we're all feeling relatively the same things about being stuck in house for months and overall I'm doing okay. Um, been spending a lot more time with my family which is good since my brother and my sister were off at college and my dad works in Milwaukee. We've been kind of distant so it's been good to get together and kind of have those family dinners every night and getting to talk to each other a lot more than we would have. Thanks, Chase. Melanie. Hey, I just said that was fast. Um, I just, I kind of echo um, what uh, Kyla said. Um, what I was hearing from parents is that internet is a privilege, which 
that had never even crossed my mind before, um, knowing that the school also offers um, a reduced or even free internet option. And, um, and that it was not an easy transition for every student to have the e-learning and that a lot of them really needed that face-to-face -face, um, interaction. Um, I'll also say that I thought that um, because we've been so concerned with students and adults being so tied to um, technology that we didn't need that human touch anymore, that we were moving away from that. I'll take it, honey. Thank you. But, ooh, ooh. but um, I think we've kind of learned that we do still need each other, like in person. And um, as for um, the restorative justice part, how I took the question, because I was uh, kind of right there with Greg, but how I took the question was um, in regards to restorative justice, it the internet can still be a really dangerous and mean place for our students. We've still seen um, lots of um, racist things happen um, on the internet and that's how the students are communicating even more seeing each other. They use Zoom as well and um, I mean I'm not really sure how you know how you would go about as a school reprimanding or trying to bring together students that have been involved in a, an internet issue during school time. Um, I think that's a that's a, a huge pickle that will take a while to unpack. Um, but as far as um, me personally, my husband uh, is on the front lines. And so I was one of those people who um, thought, wow, we have a really bad flu. And, um, but I didn't take it any different than the bird flu or Ebola or any of those things until my husband came home and said, no, people are really dying every single day. And he has to get masked, um, covered from head to toe on and be on COVID-19 floors. So um, we literally bunkered down right after that and had not even gone out to the front porch. So we just recently have been able to um, enjoy our neighbors from afar. But um, other than that, we have been incredibly lucky. Um, my pastor did have COVID-19, um, but she just recently recovered. Um, and I don't have any deaths to report. So I thank God for that. Thanks, Melanie. Um, Sherilyn? Good evening, everyone. Um, I guess I'll take the second part of the question first. Uh, my family is well. Uh, as you all know, I'm not from here, so m I have a lot of family in New York um, and spread out through the East Coast, and that area has been hit really hard. Um, none of my family has contracted COVID, thankfully, um, but I have, my grandfather has cancer, and so trying to get treatment and surgery was a big to do um, remotely um, and a, a great emotional impact on us here because we're not able to go there with him, um, but he is doing well. Um, as far as restorative online or digitally, virtually, I think um, allowing space and reaching out to those that we know under normal circumstances, when we were in the building, we would be reaching out to these students or faculty or staff who normally need support, finding ways to reach out and allow our community to know that they're not alone, they're not forgotten about, um, could be the linchpin for when we return to know that someone thought enough of me as a student or me as a faculty to reach out, to check in. And I will say um, for me having a son at OP who under stress shuts down um, and doesn't respond to emails and such, I've had lots of teachers reaching out, making sure that he's okay. And so just being able to reach out and be the person, be the, the support for each other is how we can roll this in virtually. Thank you. Linda Francis. 
Hi, I'm going to answer the second question first. Um, I am well and all of my family is well. Um, and then with respect to experiencing restorative practices, um, personally, um, I am very fortunate to have a job that is that continues on remotely and that um, practices um, providing a, a fair amount of grace with respect to people's ability to, um, to interact. Um, I feel a bit removed or distant from restorative practices as they relate to our young people um, since, since um, on this um, stay at home, I feel disconnected to what's happening with other young people in the community. Thanks, Linda. Janelle. Sorry, I was playing with my screen here. Um, I am doing well. My family uh, is doing well. I um, feel more busy. I didn't think I could ever feel more busy being working from home, but I am more busy <laughs> working from home than when we were in school, it seems. Um, probably because I'm trying to also manage a four-year-old and a seven-year-old who keep an eye on the door in the background. If it, if it opens, I may, you, you may see me turn my screen off. So <laughs> my husband had to leave and he's on his way back. Um, how I am experiencing restorative practices is um, connecting with kids who we see are not engaging with remote learning. And um, I'm having a really good time doing Google Meets and Zooms with them so that they could see my face and I can see theirs and connecting them with some other adults um, including on their team, including their teachers who are being um, compassionate and understanding that this way of learning just doesn't work for everyone and seeing the compassion and flexibility that our teachers are showing is restoring these kids um, feelings of having an ability to succeed in this kind of learning. And so um, I'm happy to be a part of that. Um, I'm not being very restorative with my own children. And so I need to work on that. And so I think the, uh, the one part is being depleted and I'm doing well in the other part. So I'm working on that. Thanks, Janelle. Um, Francis. Hi. Um, I'm doing well. Um, we started the whole crisis with um, a child on each coast. So one in Brooklyn, which was kind of scary, just going day by day. Now it seems um, in some ways, it feels like some, you know, we can have several days in general that are really great and positive and feel like things are, are going well. And then, you know, a day where it's just awful and then you have to reset. So. I think we're doing a lot of that in our family. That's what I tend to do. Um, with restorative practices, um, what I've found in a good way is that online, everything is so intentional in a lot of the work that I'm doing, whether it's one-on-ones or circle on video. So it's so intentional. And I don't know, there, there's just been like a real beauty to people opening up. Um, there has been conflict, but then, um, with so much intention, um, we've been able to resolve things uh, or work at resolving things in a really clear way. It almost seems like, well, everything's changed, so let's just get right to the point and, and heal when things um, are unsettled. So it's actually, there's been a lot of positive. Thanks, Francis. Karen. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I Personally doing well, I work from home a lot anyway, so my own work life has not changed that much. Um, the outer family, um, my brother-in-law had been sick and died during the pandemic and so from leukemia, but then what goes on in hospitals now about family members not being able to come in to support their loved ones because of the COVID thing becomes hard. 
Um, I had a daughter-in-law who was laid off before the pandemic, but now looking for a job when nobody's hiring, you know. So we have some stressors going on out there, but in general, life is, life is fine. Um, in terms of restorative practices, one of the things that's outside of our school community, but not necessarily all, all the way so, is there's so much now um, out there about how the pandemic is calling into sharp relief disparities in our society that affect our students, like um, you know, health disparities or other kinds of disparities that are becoming more clear cut and, and worrisome about the long term effect, like the internet, not being able to do e-learning for our own school community. And like when I, my former school community where I worked was um, CPS, you know, and certainly affecting um, the, those school communities. So I just think the disparities that were there before and how to, how to re have restorative um, things happen, um, we all, I think it calls into question more what we all need to be doing to try to do that. Um, after the after this is gone, hopefully. Thanks, Karen. Dr. Roxana. Thank you. Um, I and my family are doing well. Uh, I, somebody talked about being more busy than ever. I, I think that completely applies to me as well. I, I didn't feel like I could work anymore, and uh, here is the new truth. Uh, it's just the lines between uh, work and personal are blurred even more. Um, and um, as far as restorative practices, um, I feel like this pandemic has uh, brought the best in many people and um, the understanding and uh, grace is more pronounced than ever. And um, that's what we're trying to do with our employees. Um, we have many groups of employees who are not used uh, to working using technology. So it's been a challenge, um, but you see that when you uh, have a little bit of patience and more understanding and uh, try to find an approach to everybody that really pays out. Thank you. Uh, Talib. Um, I'll start with, um, personally, uh, I'm pretty good. Um, none of my family has really been affected by Corona too much. Um, there haven't been any layoffs in my family, so that's, that's positive news. So pretty good personally. Um, talking about more about restorative practices. Um, I heard a lot about, uh, from the other students talking about how teachers are being understanding. And I think that's going to be one crucial part of it because if you think about restorative practices, it's usually about being equal and having the same standard for all students. But you have to understand that different students now are going to have different standards from where they're at. And for some students who might not be able to have the strongest Wi-Fi or might not be able to connect from two to three because of whatever may be happening, having different due dates and being able to be uh, flexible with your teachers can really be key. I unfortunately, um, my teachers personally haven't been very flexible with the work, but again, I'm not really behind, so I haven't had to really, you know, contact them and like really try to work and plan out. But um, besides that, uh, now is a really good time to be able to work on your own type of restorative practices, um, whether it's within your family or without, or if it's in the world. Um, my mom came up with the idea of doing um, uh, free little libraries. So with my program, I started a not-for-profit in eighth grade, Opportunity for All, and now we've started, we're now in the process of starting to build free little libraries. We're going to place them in North Lawndale area so that students who don't have books and might not have them for a while can read at home and still have the opportunity to grow because that's going to be a huge uh, restorative practice um, opportunity for students out there. So, and also thank you to Francis Graff for donating that. So appreciate that. And that's it. Thanks, Talib. Ralph. All right, so restorative practices, they're gonna be imperfect at best, right? Because there isn't exactly a lot of training that has gone into the individuals involved with restorative practice, 
practice piece at the school, much like distance learning. And I just think to my role as a professor at Roosevelt University, before I could teach an online course, I went through a very intensive nine-week class uh, just to help inform me on how to build an internet community and a sense of community in the class, et cetera. None of our teachers, faculty have had that experience. And so whatever we do from a restorative practice standpoint is going to be imperfect. I will say that I think a number of teachers have gone an extra mile during this time. But as an honest observation, uh, my daughter, who's a senior, who will not get a prom, who may not get a graduation, who is in constant contact with a lot of her peer friends that are seniors, I could tell you that it has not been universal that the kids feel reached out to or supported. And there is some work to do there for the senior class. I mean, this is a major loss for the seniors in a lot of different ways and ways that, you know, as adults, we probably take for granted and forget what it was like. But I'm telling you, listening in on some of these Zoom calls, these kids arranged with each other, I could say our restorative practices have been imperfect, and that's to be understood given the challenge. Uh, from a personal note, you know, I, it's great having my son who had to have a virtual graduation from the University of Michigan, but he is now a University of Michigan grad at home, and his girlfriend is here with us, and my family has managed to avoid the coronavirus. However, one of my close colleagues from the Center for Tax and Budget Accountability, the think tank I work with, his, his uncle passed away yesterday in New York from corona. And he grew up in New York. And so uh, I, I, all my family is still is either in New York or Connecticut. So it's still a pretty scary place out there for them, my sisters and my nieces and nephews and those kinds of things. And I have a couple of nieces and nephews that are first responders. I have a police officer. I have two EMTs. And so they are out on the line and, you know, I check in on them daily. But it's, it's, it's a challenge. My family, though, fortunate enough, we all... My wife and I still have our jobs. We're still here at home, and it's in one way nice to have our son and daughter back around and to remember how well our kids actually get along with each other, which is a blessing. Thanks, Ralph. Carrie. Did you say Carrie, Gina? I did, yep. Okay, sorry. I had some voices in my hallway. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'll start with, I'm doing well. I think it ebbs and flows some days, depending on how long I'm in Zoom calls and meetings for, and if I've had a chance to do my meditation and exercise, when those things happen, everything just seems to be better. Um, with the last couple of rainy days and a full schedule, I haven't gotten that in and had a moment with my son earlier, and I was like, yeah, part of that is because um, just give me some ice cream, Mama. Not right now, in a second, okay? Um, you know, and part of that is because I didn't take care of myself first. So I got to remember to do that. And when I do that, it definitely helps. Um, in terms of restorative practice, I'm, I'm certainly fortunate that um, in D97 and certainly on the teams that I am work with every day and I'm a part of, we really prioritize relationships, care, and grace with one another. It's built into our team meetings. We always start with a mood check-in, checking in how did we go, how did this go for you, um, engaging in virtual circles, um, sometimes closing circles at the end of the week. So trying to just make sure those practices live and breathe and are reflected in our values, but are also part of just how we do the work with each other. Um, and certainly following up on with people who you know might be going through some additional challenge right now, even if it's just a quick chat like hey just want to see how you're doing how are you you know how are things going and I think um, relationships I notice have been strengthened um, in many ways um, and I feel just the way folks are really reaching out and expressing care for one another to me is really at the heart of restorative practices um, and I'm very um, grateful that I am part of an organization in the community that values that. Um, it's certainly been um, uh, strengthening for me during this time. Thanks, Carrie. Susan. Okay, sorry to be slow there, getting myself unmuted. Um, so 
um, just in having the chance to listen to people and hear the, the very positive um, restorative outreach that's happening to youth in school and amongst each other um, is really fantastic to hear about and inspiring. And also hearing other, you know, kind of um, say, well, in this situation, it, it, there's still work to do. Really, you know, is reality. And there's always, a, it's always important to see both and to see how really well we're doing and also to, to get better and look, look uh, to work on those places that need more work. So that's kind of how I hear the restorative issues in the high school. Um, I've had lots of opportunities to be on Zoom and that really feels like it's a forum that people are using to make circles with each other and hear from each other. So that's, that's been really good um, because it it's, can be so isolating. And um, those of us who really need to have in-person connections with people, it's, um, it's just tough. So, so it's good. And our neighbors very early on, um, we go out at eight o'clock every night and clap. <laughs> and that's been really fantastic. Um, so that's good. For me personally, um, our family is good. Um, you know, there there are so many um, layers to 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 um, respond to. I can say closely, my family is really good. We're all well, um, and we feel very fortunate to be in this. Um, just have this full well knowing that, hearing, listening to the news, hearing, knowing that the inequity, reading the paper, the inequities of our culture, of our society, of the globe are so pronounced, it's very painful. And so a lot of energy for me is in that split. And um, so I've been doing a lot of thinking and um, about action and um, that frustration is really powerful for me. So it's kind of a push-pull through creativity that's come out of the situation or positives, but um, I'm really troubled by um, what, what's happening to people, not me, but to many people. It's so extreme. Thanks, Susan. Um, we have seven, one, two, three, four. We have seven people left, so I'm just going to ask you to be mindful of time because we do want to spend the last 40 minutes, about 45 minutes, really working on what we came here to work on tonight. But what you're talking about, you're sharing right now, is actually getting to the heart of what we're about to do. So thank you for that. But just be mindful of your time. Uh, Felicia Starks-Turner. Um, thanks, Gina. For me, I feel extremely blessed. Uh, my family is healthy. Um, everyone, for the most part, is still gainfully em employed. And for a few of my family members that are not, um, it's not really impacting them all of that much. So we, we feel extremely blessed on, on that end. Everyone's healthy. Um, my mom has a caregiver. My parents are elderly and the caregivers are still able to come in and um, help them, which is um, wonderful because we were concerned about that for a while. As far as our restorative practices, I would say I would echo what some people have said about you know, relationships and, and grace. And our relationships are the foundation and the key to a lot of um, what we see going on or lack thereof. And I have been part of conversations with principals and staff members with parents and just helping the staff to understand uh, uh, that people need some grace because this is a new experience and people are experiencing and being impacted by this differently. And we need to really go above and beyond to help parents facilitate this because this is um, uncharted 
territory and people are already thinking about ideas above and beyond after this to build those relationships remotely and also starting to talk about ideas about how to do things in a more enhanced way when we transition back to on-site learning. Thank you. Thank you, Felicia. Um, Dr. Prude Adams. Um, I don't know where to start. So I will say from a restorative aspect, um, I think there are those who believe that um, No, I've changed that. I, I, I've realized during this time off that our kids are struggling and there are some things that we knew and some things we didn't know uh, where they have been harmed that is now surfacing with them being at home in isolation. And I think the deans, uh, from my perspective, have really, really, really tried to restore over this time, some of the harm that, as I said, that we knew and we thought had been mitigated, but also addressing mm -hmm. new harm uh, and really trying to find that balance from a, a virtual perspective where, you know, in most cases you have people in the same space so that, you know, as a part of the restoration, you have people together so they can hear the harm that they've caused. And I am, I just want to say I'm very proud of the work that they are doing because it is so obvious over the last couple of weeks that our, stu our children are hurting. And some of it they have kept so deep inside for such a long time. And now it's coming out and just trying to be a support for them and to bridge and to help them heal in a time when there are so many other things going on for them is a challenge, but um, I am very proud of the team that is trying to address it. Uh, personally, I'm a little bit all over the place. Uh, you've heard members of the team talk about the hours we put in. And so I told someone today, I go from, I Zoom out of a meeting to go hang out, which is another thing in a meeting. And then you leave there to go to meeting which is another platform. You leave that form, platform to go to a web meeting. And I've done all four of those different platforms just today alone, some multiple times. And so you find working at home that you put in more hours. And so self-care <laughs> is important. I have been impacted personally twice uh, by COVID death. And, um, the fact that I am in that vulnerable group, um, 65 in a couple of weeks, uh, African-American high blood pressure uh, is scary for me um, because I see people, my friends, my age group that are dying. So that, that's a challenge for me right now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pruitt Adams. LeVar? Good evening, everyone. And uh, first of all, let me uh, just thank everyone for sharing um, what's been said to this point. Uh, I'll start with me personally. Um, myself and my immediate family, we're, we're doing well. Everyone's healthy and safe. Um, uh, like Joy Lynn, I have had uh, some impacts uh, from, from COVID-19 from other family members in Florida. Uh, a friend of mine was just recently diagnosed on, uh, on Saturday. He, he's out on the front lines um, at a Heart Grove Hospital, not too far from, uh, <clears throat> from the school. So there's certainly been some, uh, some challenge with dealing with the, with the impact of, uh, of COVID uh, just in my immediate circle. Um, but uh, you know, beyond that, my, my family's doing well. Uh, we're healthy and safe. Um, happy to have gainful employment, and just you know, trying to stay ahead of uh, of, the, of the news that's coming out, and, and being as prepared as possible. Uh, as far as restorative practices, um, 
our motivational mentor uh, program, uh, both of the, uh, the coordinators in there, Shannon uh, Perryman and also uh, Patrick Crisp, have done a, a wonderful job of, of remaining connected with the, the students who were frequent flyers in that program. Uh, they're still doing uh, check-ins daily with students. And uh, you know we're also having uh, motivational mentor meetings on Fridays uh, at noon, just to, uh, as another source of check-in and programming that happens there. Um, additionally, just by virtue of my position, right, as the Executive Director of Equity and, and developing the procedures for our racial equity policy is restorative work uh, in and of itself. Um, and just continuing to, to push forward it with the thought in mind that, uh, you know, that that was restoration work that was being done uh, prior to this, but even more important now, as Susan had, had pointed out a, a few moments ago about just uh, how, um, disparities in our society are being magnified now. Um, and, and one last thing, I was in a, an affinity space uh, this afternoon with the, uh, the Black Leadership Advisory Council. Uh, and that is a group that meets uh, bi-weekly and uh, it's uh, spearheaded by Lanise Lush. And she has done a wonderful job of just making sure uh, that uh, that affinity group stays connected and we're checking on one another and even having conversations about uh, students, uh, special education students in particular today and how that has been a struggle uh, for those students just with the remote learning, um, asking critical questions about, you know, how is, how is um, uh, cultural relevancy going to show up in remote learning? What are the plans for that? Uh, and be making sure to connect those students with, uh, with motivational mentoring as well, just for the social emotional support. So, um, you know, to Ralph's point, it's, it's uh, imperfect at best, but it's something that, you know, we continue to chop away at. Thanks, LeVar. Mm -hmm. um, for, we have just a couple more people, but I feel like it's important that we have this sharing. So David walks up. Hello, uh, everybody. Um, you know, it is very difficult um, during this time to uh, have restorative practices. What I can tell you is that um, when I go to meetings um, and um, when, when you just look at things, I tend to take a step back and look at things uh, through a different lens. So I think that helps me. Um, and uh, one of the things that I personally did is I just reached out to every single one of my team members on a one-on-one -on -one basis and called them and, and checked in on them and checked in on, asked them not as a boss, but as a friend, as a coworker, what can I do for them? How they've been impacted, how their lives, don't just put the work stuff away for a moment. Um, and uh, you know, to me that really helped me as an individual uh, move forward because uh, others then reached back out to me. Um, so I think that is, is very helpful, um, although I think um, what Greg mentioned earlier is, is, is it's very difficult to um, move forward on a lot of the things because a lot of the things we were doing are hands on. Um, in regards to my family, everybody's fine. Um, we have not been impacted. Um, although I miss everybody, I haven't seen my mom in a couple of months, so it's, it's difficult. Um, but you know, it's just we just take things one day at a time. Thanks, David. Wendy. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'll start with the question number one as far as restorative practices. We actually used restorative practices when we had to have a uh, sensitive and potentially volatile discussion about what college my daughter um, chose. It was my husband's idea to use restorative practices to do that and to use a talking piece, and it worked great. Um, we only had a little bit of tears and <laughs> she made a decision that same day and that's during that same con conversation and that was her choice. She wanted to make a decision at, at, by the end of that conversation and it was made. So that worked really well. Um, and uh, I, I was a little surprised my husband suggested that, but I'm glad that he did because it really helped to keep emotion down. Um, and then as far as my business, I had to come up with boundaries. I had to make boundaries in my business because uh, many of my clients, I think, felt that I now have unlimited time to work for them because I'm working from home and that's not the case. So 
I decided that I needed to have some boundaries and let my clients know and talk, talk to them about that. And a couple of my clients felt the same way. You know, when we started talking about it, they feel the same way with their clients or with their employees. So that's something that I was able to do without having conflict or um, get people getting upset, but just having a conversation about boundaries. And, you know, you, you can't call me or expect me to, you know, be in a meeting at 9 p.m. It's just not going to do it. So <laughs> that worked out well. And then per, uh, personally, we're all doing well. We do have some challenges. Mark, uh, my husband is, works, is a manager for FedEx. And so he goes to work every day. And uh, we just cover him in prayer because FedEx didn't do a good job in the beginning with protective, um, uh, protective gear. They're much better now, but they have had four people to date in his building who have come down with COVID. And so he is there probably the equivalent of about six days a week. And he oversees deep cleaning every Saturday. So he, that to, for him, that is stressful to do that. I am working from home. And then of course, having a senior in the home um, who didn't have prom, who isn't gonna have graduation, who's trying to take, you know, has to take AP exams next week, who has to do her homework and then to prepare for college, it's a lot. It's a lot to do without being able to go out of the house other than taking a walk or going to the grocery store. And so I, I feel that we're blessed in that Mark and I both have our income. Our income hasn't changed at all, but it is it is very stressful. And we both have parents who, his mother lives alone and she, she lives in St. Louis and his sisters look in on her and, you know, to help, help to take care of her. But that is, a concern as well. And my parents, uh, we had to force, basically my sisters and I had to force my dad to stop going to work because my mother has several, several underlying conditions where he was putting her at risk. And um, he eventually did stop going to work. And she, my mom is a social butterfly. So she said, can, the other day she said, can you just, can I just die today? You know, so it's like, it's, it's a difficult thing. Um, but I, I, we have planned a drive-by for her on Mother's Day, and I think that's going to help because she hasn't seen any of us. My dad is fine. He's a hermit, but she, this is, this is very difficult for her. So one of my sisters said, why don't we do a drive-by, do that thing like you've been seeing on Facebook with decorate the car, take some signs, stand outside on the lawn, and, you know, salute her for Mother's Day. So we're doing, other, you know, other than that, we're doing well. We just have to adjust to this new normal. And wondering if Mike is going to school in the fall. That's the big question. Thanks, Wendy. Jason. Good evening, everybody. Um, so let's, uh, I'm, let me answer the first question first regarding the digital part of restorative practices uh, in, in my line of work as an interventionist and also as the director of summer school, I've been getting a lot of emails and trying to advocate for, for those that can't advocate for themselves. This makes me realize that I think internet should be a civil right uh, across the board. Um, but the three things that stick out to me that I, that I wanna make sure that um, all families, including the way I present myself, when I'm either calling them or sending an email that I'm being flexible, that I'm being empathic, and that I'm being kind to everyone's situation. In addition to that, um, I think it's important that, that we are, and including in my role in particular, um, understanding that um, kids and families don't have necessarily have the ability to, to sometimes know what to say or how to say things. And it's important for us to be able to step up and to be able to assist in, in being that liaison when it comes to um, technology and how to uh, advocate for themselves. Um, in, in regards to my own um, a personal immediate family everyone's doing well extended family not so not so well and and friends and family uh, particularly being an asian male um, having to hear some of the hate things that are going on in the media uh, which is a concern for me um, and concern for the the uh, the kids of uh, asian descent in, in our community and so that's that weighs heavily on my mind also talking to a few of the faculty and, and hoping um, um, that uh, will bring that in the forefront of our consciousness as we as we move forward to in, in, in our in our space. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Lincoln. 
you, everybody. Um, uh, second question first. I'm physically fine. Uh, we had a couple of our uh, family, but everyone's uh, health. Kind of hard to hear you, Lincoln. Can you hear me? Is this any better? Hello. Closer is better. Yes. All right. Um, no, um, I'm fine. Uh, family's fine. We've had um, a couple of close calls, but um, for the most part, people are paying attention to the distancing and keeping still. Um, mentally, this is been a bit of a challenge for me. Um, I'm doing a lot better than I was, say, a month ago. Um, I found myself less busy than I wanted to be at certain points. Um, and I did find some of my work impacted. Um, and so I found myself stuck between trying to recover what I felt I had lost, but then also just being more reflective around, you know, should I be doing something differently structurally? And I think that applies to my thoughts on uh, where we are in terms of sort of justice. I think this uh, experience has exposed a lot of the inequity that is in our society. And, um, you know, as we look to restore, we have to also recognize that there's a lot of things that aren't really well built to begin with. So restoring them isn't necessarily where we want to go. So I see this as an opportunity to really, um, you know, use the empathy and the fact that we're all experiencing something, but then also recognize that we're all experiencing something different and build upon that, uh, that, that empathy so that we can uh, create a community that, that is frankly worth restoring and restoring for all of us. Thanks, Lincoln. And Dr. Jackie Moore. Hi, everyone. Um, good to hear everyone's voice and see your faces. Uh, personally, doing okay. Um, a friend asked me earlier how I'm doing. She said, well, just at this moment. And that's, uh, I think, the way that I'm best living um, because it is, uh, you know, there are times when it's uh, certainly a struggle. Uh, my daughters are home and going through their own uh, feelings of college days being interrupted and having to um, do finals and papers remotely and um, adjusting to that and also adjusting to responsibilities at home. Uh, my mom lives with us and so helping to care for her as well. Um, my son is still uh, working and because I have uh, lupus, uh, haven't been able to see him other than through a car window for the last six weeks. Um, so that has been, you know, a challenge. And uh, restorative practice, I, you know, I do echo what everyone has said and Personally, those practices um, have been a part of my world, you know, family, certainly now with all of us being here together, it is helpful to, to have that toolkit. Um, but also, as a board member, um, and trying to make sure our work continues that uh, seeing in our community, how differently uh, things are valued. And uh, so for me, it's been a, a moment to reflect on my own issues of empathy and perspective taking and how do I um, build relationships in certain spaces where it feels nearly impossible. So have struggled with that a bit, but doing well, thanks. Thanks, Jackie. I believe that I covered all of the, um, I got to all of our committee members. Um, I'm just gonna close this out in the circle here. You. The reason why it's important that we had the time, and this did take up a lot of our time tonight, first and foremost, it did, in, intentionally. Because what we are setting about to do as a culture, climate, and behavior committee, and when we're having conversations about restorative practices and what it means to be involved in that, it's relationship building and it takes time. So let us not be fooled by any of the ideas that we are looking at a quick fix to anything that's going on that can happen or that we can impact. So let's just be clear because hearing each and every one of your stories and what you're going through tonight and us sharing that time and space together is foundational to whatever we're going to be able to do. And I know I've said that before, but I just have to echo it again. The piece that is first and foremost for me right now is that whatever veil that there was of inequity has been lifted whatever veil that anybody thought that they could hide behind, that it is not this, is this. It is very clear. We do not have, you could look, you could listen to the comments of each and every one of us who shared tonight and identify who has been impacted more by what is happening. 
So as we take about our work here, our work that we have to do with looking at the code of conduct, with looking at how we can inform, support, and support the, the administration and the school in how we move to a truly restorative framework, as we begin to look at that, our work is actually going to be split up between this meeting and our next meeting. And I know that there were some questions and concerns about if we're looking at a code of conduct, how come we don't have that code of conduct to look at yet? And the administration is going to talk to us about that. But what's important for us to understand is that the impact that we're going to have to be able to, uh, the recommendations that are going to come from this committee need to be rooted in the ideas that inequity is so clear, so present, and so prevalent that no one can hide from it. No one can pretend it does not exist. And we must make recommendations from that space. So when we're looking at the code of conduct, when we're looking at the recommendations that the, the book, what they've worked on as an administration, as a team, what the input they've gotten from teachers and students and all of the people in the, that group, we need to be looking at the fact that and evaluating it from a perspective of how equitable is this? And how equitable is this in a virtual environment? How equitable is this in all of the spaces? And then as a committee, our work is highly going to be in, in, impactful if, we're look, if we can maintain that focus of equity because we have had and been fortunate enough to have the opportunity to get some of the pieces of what the racial equity policy looks like and actually have some questioning and some comment and some feedback as a committee. That work is we're gonna need to dig into that even deeper. So I just, I, everyone touched on some piece of how equity fits into what we're experiencing right now and what we're going to be experiencing moving forward and, the, and restoratively and what that means. So as I turn it over for our last 15 minutes and they were supposed to have like a half an hour and I know that Greg and Dr. Fruit Adams are like, I don't know what you want me to do in 15 minutes, Gina. It's okay. We have this time and we have our next meeting. And we will get through the information we need to get through now, between now and the next meeting, so that we can make a recommendation, so we can send some information to the board regarding this code of conduct. So I'm going to turn it over to the, um, Dr. Pruitt Adams. You're muted, Dr. Pruitt Adams. I'm going to save some time. Uh, I was going to talk about the role of CCB as it relates to the student code of conduct. I think you've done a good job of that. And Greg covered it in the last uh, meeting that we had in March. So to save time for the information that does need to be shared, I'm going to turn it over to him. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Pruitt Adams. And uh, thank you, Gina, too. You, uh, as you were speaking, I was thinking, all right, this is uh, a solid and appropriate introduction to the work that we're doing here. So let me first, um, I'll say thank you to you. And also, um, to talk about the approach that we're taking. So with uh, the advent of, of remote learning uh, several weeks ago now, um, the, uh, at least in the very immediate sense, the short term, the progress, the momentum that we had had within the school towards moving towards uh, shifting our, our code of conduct towards a more restorative approach um, was, was paused, of course. Everybody in the school was keened in on ramping up our remote practices. And that included conversations with our teachers. We have, um, over the past several weeks, begun to have conversations, uh, you know, put those back in place. In fact, our last one was April 24th, where we've talked with a number of our teachers um, who uh, were originally trained as part of the advanced circle training for restorative justice uh, and, and, and gathered their feedback on, on where we are with this restorative uh, uh, code of conduct. Um, but we still have work to do. We still have work to do. And so the fact that we actually are in a situation right now where we have uh, 15 minutes uh, in this meeting allows us to do what we really need to do, uh, which is set the groundwork and say, this is the work that we have done uh, up until this point. And uh, within the next several weeks, between now and our June meeting, uh, we will continue to gather that feedback and have those incredibly necessary in-building conversations with our teachers. Um, and uh, when we move into June, we'll be able to present the, the, the full code of conduct. So that explains kind of that timeline that you were uh, referencing, Gina. So, so thanks for that. Um, I also want to say um, uh, by last way of introduction, and that we have exactly 15 minutes at this point, 
um, that Janelle and Linda have uh, have done just exceptional work um, working with our advanced circle keepers, talking with a variety of teachers, uh, and gathering uh, the information that's needed to put together what really you will see is the groundwork for a completely different approach um, to how we think. So with that said, um, we're gonna go through this presentation here and uh, I don't know if we'll have a ton of time, but we won't at the end for a, a lot of conversation and feedback. Um, but please know that in a month, okay, we are going to come back with a much more full um, presentation and information for us to break up into groups and, and get some feedback in on. With that said, Greg, can you sure. talk, uh, can, Greg, can you just talk a little bit about um, the, um, the additional pieces that, you know, looking at it virtually, why we're, why we're, why we don't have the whole code of conduct to look at right now. I know you touched on it a little bit. Yeah. Um, beyond just what I said. So, um, it's kind of what I, I said, I think, um, I'll see if I can elaborate on it a little bit. In March, uh, we had been moving along and had plans for gather uh, different bits of feedback and to formalize this thing um, so that at this meeting in May, we would have the complete code of conduct done. However, we essentially, with remote learning and everything that happened there, we lost a month. And so what we're doing is we're essentially taking what had been in the April and May CCB meeting and we're, and we're kicking it over to the May and June CCB meetings to allow us to have those incredibly necessary teacher conversations. And, Thank you. Uh, I just needed it to be a little more explicit. Possible. Yeah, does it help? I just needed it to be a little bit more explicit. Thank you. Sure, and, sure. Okay. Um, my goal is to kind of do an overview next week, and I'm not sure if Greg is able to join us with our school leaders group. I can join, sure. I'd be happy to join. Okay. So the student leaders can provide some feedback as well. So Linda and Janelle, you are up. And I think Linda, you're taking the, uh, the, first, uh, the first few slides. Yes, yes. good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Gina, again, for that um, opening circle because it is the springboard to what we're gonna talk about here. Um, the words I'd like you to keep in mind that came to my mind as everyone was talking kept reverting between grace and mercy. So a lot of grace and a lot of mercy that's been shown to us during this time. And when I think of student behavior and student learning as they're learning how to shape behavior, um, any of you who've been at home with teenagers know there takes a lot of grace and mercy in order to see them through and to educate them through um, these different um, trials that they have and situations that they sometimes find themselves in. I'm gonna do my very best with Janelle to go through these swiftly, but I think if we go too fast, it'll leave more questions um, than understanding. So I'm gonna do my best, but if there's some left over, Gina, we may have to like split it mm -hmm. just in the sense of trying to get everyone to understand. Chris, next slide. And Linda, I would prefer that too, just for okay, the record. Good. I would prefer yeah. that we, I, we, I, we need this committee to have a full understanding of what it is they're going to be making recommendations about. That's what so, I thought. So I'm going to do my very best, but if there's some left over, please know that this conversation shall continue. Um, we start this conversation of, with our code of conduct, understanding that shifting direction in terms of moving things towards a more restorative practice model is also involved in universal mind shifts throughout our entire community uh, building everywhere. So we started the conversation with trying to understand what is it that we needed to do it to have in mind and to work on people's ideals of what they think discipline is supposed to look like and supposed to be. Because we've come through years of what we've been indoctrinated into and restorative practice is challenging that. And a law was put in place in order to make sure that we were exercising um, the restorative work that needs to be done within the school. And that came through a law called SB 100. Um, Chris, next slide. So what is SB 100 so that everybody understands? And it's been in place for about three or four years at this time, where out of school suspensions um, and in school suspensions are really frowned upon because you are removing a child from their learning environment. And when doing that, the consideration is that it must be extremely severe for that to have to occur. 
otherwise what we should be focusing on is how do we reshape that student's behavior so that those things don't continue anymore. So what you see on this slide are three guiding questions that have to be present as we're thinking about moving towards an out of school suspension that we're questioning ourselves and that we have provided interventions that could help a student to see what that behavior was, address that behavior, and then reshape that behavior with adult assistance as we're working through that. So it's intended to be a progressive approach uh, in severity versus just a one time and done type of situation. Next slide, Chris. So when we thought about changing this code of conduct, our idea was asking ourselves some questions. In order to think restoratively, you have to be thinking about who your people are, like who are our students. At Oak Park and River Forest High School, we have some things that happen within our school that have to be addressed, but in terms of major, major discipline concerns that break apart our community, we don't really have those. So it's important to know who our students are, to use the data that we've collected to inform the, and uh, the practices that we use with our students, and then understanding um, what we are uh, being committed to. So our true understanding of what infractions are and what's being committed and not addressing the infraction, but more so addressing the student. And that led us to thinking that we need to think of um, a code of conduct more holistically by changing our response and thinking of it as a behavior education plan. Um, when we were looking through other districts and the work that they have done in this area, the idea of a education plan is understanding that students are nurtured into the behaviors that they have. It's very, um, it's not usually nature, it's a nurture thing. And if we've taught them to have certain behaviors, then that means we can teach other behaviors as well. And so we don't wanna focus on offenses, we wanna focus on students as we go through and lead our work within this plan. Um, next slide, Chris. So the overview of the plan is it's driven by that word education and it means just what we mean it in school when we're having class. It's educating students to understanding what is happening, why that happened, who was harmed, what we have to do to make that better, and it's driven by our beliefs, our expectations, and then what our actions will be in order to help um, students to learn a different way of doing things. It's our responsibility as the adults in the building and also as peer to peer to help each other to make it through the process of high school. And in order to do that, we have to work together. The one thing I say about restorative work, it requires involvement. Like you have to be involved in order for it to work. And there is sometimes some hesitancy um, on the parts of people because they don't wanna be harmed further or they don't feel as though they can take an interaction between someone who may have harmed them. But we try to make sure that there's an understanding that that's where the work is. Like the work is in having that information shared between parties so that there can be a true understanding of what I need to do to not have that happen again in my life or in the life of another. So that's what we're thinking about when we talk about education plan um, and, and kind of changes in terms of our code of conduct where it has just been about um, addressing infractions. But this is about, again, the whole student and their whole development as a social, emotional and academic being within our school. Next Linda, Linda, if I can just add, Absolutely. part of this is also related to our um, working on our culture, both around the entire school community and within each individual classroom, and how establishing that culture of warmth that we've been talking about all school year and building those relationships, um, how that will drive behaviors in classes and how we respond to them. And so we part of that work has been working with Umoja, as mentioned earlier, um, in working on developing those kinds of cultures that are welcoming and warm and everyone feels physically and emotionally safe so that if and when behavior issues arise, we are already, kids are already programmed with what 
um, kind of kind and compassionate response they should expect um, versus what maybe you know has been seen in the past. Thank you, Janelle. And then also just even in our, the practice in this meeting is starting to circle. You are planting the seed of that work within the members of this group, which allow us to also bring that more forth within the building into understanding why that's so important. So in the shaping of an education plan, it's very important that you have some guiding principles because without that, it's like, what are we doing and why are we doing it? So these are some examples of some guiding principles that help to build a behavior education plan. And so what we're looking at is where OPRF fits in this and how we're going to make sure that's manifested in our document at once it's ready and produced. Um, important here, like in this box uh, on the bottom right, progressive discipline, not zero tolerance. Zero tolerance was a very huge practice in the past where you could actually say, we just don't tolerate this in schools and there could be expulsion uh, proceedings that happen. That's very rare now that you can even have something that, that happens like that. Um, you have to believe in teaching and intervention over consequence and punishment. And that again is a mindset shift because some people believe you're supposed to have this thing happen if they do this. And that's not the way an education plan works. We cannot exclude, we have to make sure we're being inclusive and we have to be grounded in a strong focus of engagement and learning. Who are the we? The entire building. I often say in terms of having restorative practices, it sounds good until it's your child. I've seen people who have been in great support of restorative practices and then if it's their own child, it's like, uh-uh. That one has to be put out and that's not how it works it has to be universal and we have to embrace all of our students i often find myself saying we these are these students are all part of this this community and we have to educate them all which means we have to make sure that we have an answer to helping them when they're having some concerns as well and one thing that i would add to that linda is just about how our code our plan needs to really um, illustrate the um, absence or the the, the uh, decreased use of um, zero tolerance policies and so it's going to be important that this plan show that even something that we feel is really really bad that you know needs to what, what we could look at our reports from the past and see that we had some pretty um, pretty punitive responses to that they look different and that the law now says in about 100 and what we are looking to achieve now says you can actually do something pretty bad and we we still feel the obligation to educate you and where the perspective used to be that the lesson was learned in the consequence this is where that mind shift comes in that we want to change what the lesson is and how we deliver that lesson. Thank you, Janelle. And then Chris, next slide. Uh, one back, Chris, because there should be a second page of guiding principles. Okay, thank you. A couple of things I want to point out on this page in terms of these principles. It is very important that we work together as a school and, a fam and families and community in order for this to work. The partnership is critical. And as Greg spoke as well, so as it is within our building with our teachers and our staff, because everyone has to be involved in this process for it to work. It is grounded in the bottom left box that says to us, we have to have a belief that every child, when provided with appropriate support, can learn and succeed. That is the root of everything that we're doing in a code of conduct. We have to believe we're providing access to a fair and appropriate education for all of our students and with our help that can happen. We presented data at our last um, board meeting to speak to what our disparities are and to make sure that we're addressing that in a code of conduct or a behavior education plan because it is not right that it's even felt that some things happen for one group and not for another. So we have to put that out in the forefront and address that. And then please know that a code of conduct and this behavior education plan is all about 
problem solving and being proactive as well as having a, an answer reactively. So the things we do before something happens are critical as well so that when something happens, we're able to address that as a, a stronger community and not as someone pointing fingers at you know what to what happened. Um, next slide. So Linda, I'm gonna stop uh -huh. you. Um, so I um, we are actually at our eight o'clock time. Okay. Right? Um, and it feels like this is a good place to stop because you the last piece that you went into there was about who all was going to need to be involved. And mm -hmm. as our committee um, the, likely we will be sharing more information with the committee before we meet again so that you mm -hmm. have some some more pieces to review as well as we'll finish up this piece of information the largest part of our next meeting will be focused on our discussion and our input in our june meeting um okay. did i know that that's what we discussed does that sound accurate to what we discussed lincoln greg dr Poot adams yeah, I, I think that works really well. And if I can just say yes. one thing, I, I want to speak to some of the, the I, just very, very quickly, that um, one of the things that we need to, to do as a school is make sure that we communicate out that while this, well, this restorative approach is really necessary because it focuses on the need to treat people as complete human beings and it, 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 it honors our role as educators, it certainly doesn't mean that we don't have um, standards, right? That we don't have expectations, uh, that we don't um, recognize that um, there are learning behaviors, right? That we are looking to grow um, with, with, with some specificity in the building. And so the idea that we are moving away from that is something that I want everybody to kind of keep an open eye to. And that as we move towards um, our next meeting in a month, uh, I think you'll see this develop uh, as we continue these conversations and uh, bring uh, more information back to our meeting. I think yeah. the key pieces, just real quick, that, that Linda spoke to is, it's educating. If children learn the behaviors that they have, and we have to teach them the other behaviors, and we have to do it with grace and care. Uh, it's about relationships, building relationships, not destroying relationships in an environment of trust. And I mean, I've seen it happen. It can happen. We just, as Greg said, have to have an open mind to that. Will it look different? It will. Uh, but if you set the expectations and expect the students to rise to that, they will do that as well. And please expect to be challenged because it's going to challenge all of us. And it has been challenging us. It's going to challenge everyone. It's going to sound as though something might be missing or something else could happen, but it's challenging us and moving us to a higher place. And it's and, and we are going to take children along with us and they will learn. We just have to be part of the process. Yeah. And I just wanna add one last piece that is important. What we are looking to do is change how we have even just organized how um, the code looks. Currently, the code is organized by behaviors and acts. And we'd like to change that to have it organized by our response, by how the, adult, how the adults react so that we are not just looking at the act, but at the child and the role of that child. And so, and, and I don't, I will not, I will say that we have worked in that way as a dean, we have been doing that, but we have also been driven by our code of conduct that just is organized in that way. And so we want it even just to look differently just by when you open up the book. That's a great this closing why, comment, thank you. Yeah, and this is why I wanted to ensure that our committee really understands what we're about to engage in, right? Everyone on this committee has a different level of understanding of what restorative practices are. And, um, we, in order for us to be able to be the stewards of this, I honestly think of our committee as the stewards of this in our community, right? Because we're going to be the ones that have the most information and knowledge to be able to share with, the, uh, with our fellow community members. It is mm -hmm. going to be critical that we understand and can process for ourselves how different and hard this is. So Linda uh, Parker, thank you so much. And, and Janelle, thank you so much for getting us started in this work. Um, what I would love for us to do is um, 
there will be more information sent to the committee prior to our next meeting so that we you have a little bit more framing before our meeting in June. And then we will finish this. Um, they'll finish up the presentation as well as we will dig into the discussion. The largest part of our meeting next time is going to be getting your feedback. So I can't thank you all enough. We're five minutes over, but I feel like that's an accomplishment for CCB because <laughs> it's not 15 minutes over. Okay, I'm just saying. And I get a little excited because you know I'm at home by myself. But um, thank you all so very much for your time tonight. If you have any concerns, comments, questions, please reach out um, and we will um, address whatever we can prior to our meeting next time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you thank all you so everyone. very much. Thank you, everyone. See you guys. Bye bye. Don't we have to adjourn? Oh. <laughs> yes, we have to adjourn. Oh, move okay, to adjourn. I'm still here. Move so to move. Adjourn. Oh, yeah. So move to, uh, I move to adjourn. Did somebody move to adjourn? Second. Sorry, Second. 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 Third. <laughs> 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 Bye. Yeah, wait, this is why we need Gail. Thank you, Gail. We need Thank to you, Gail. Okay. Talk to you soon. Okay.